can stop it now. Get all of you! We'll be the very first witnesses! While the T-Virus was terrible enough, turning people into flesh-eating zombies, there's something even worse that came out of the Umbrella Corporation's experiments. The Golgotha virus, also known as the G-Virus, is possibly one of the most volatile and unstable viruses the survival horror series has introduced to date. Its effects on its host are far more grotesque than that of the T-Virus, leading to the creation of some truly horrifying, albeit iconic, monstrosities. In this video, we're going to explore the origins of the G-Virus, the physiological effects it has on human hosts, and its place within the Resident Evil narrative. Got eyes on the G-Virus. Go on in. This is my life's work! I'm not handing over anything! We have our orders, Dr. Birkin. The series has a deep and convoluted history tied to its infamous viruses. Almost every pathogen that has infected and mutated people in the series is linked to an ancient family of RNA viruses, known as progenitors. These are said to have existed for millions, if not billions of years. One of these ancient viruses is the G-Virus, a pathogen that made its first appearance in Resident Evil 2 and was instrumental in creating the RE Universe's various outbreaks and monsters. First isolated by one of Umbrella's chief researchers, Dr. William Birkin, in 1988, the G-Virus was heavily experimented on as part of the organization's plans to create weaponized pathogens. After discovering the G-Virus in the body of a human test subject called Lisa Trevor, Birkin observed that Lisa's immune system somehow destroyed a NEA-type parasite, another one of Umbrella's creations. This led to the hypothesis that Lisa may have had the G-Virus since the early 1960s, when experiments on her body first began. The G-Virus proved to be too unpredictable for Umbrella. Its penchant for wanting to aggressively alter and mutate the human body ran counter to their desire of creating bioorganic weapons that could easily be trained and controlled. However, the company's CEO, Earl Spencer, saw its potential in eugenics and the project was moved to an underground facility in France, then later moved to the Ness facility in the outskirts of Resident Evil's iconic Raccoon City. It was there that the G-Virus project reached its final stages alongside the T-Virus project. Through the continuous abduction of local civilians, Ness researchers were able to accelerate their efforts in both projects. Throughout the timeline of the G-Virus project, both Dr. Birkin and the Umbrella Board of Executives had a volatile relationship. The virus's potential caused either party to grow suspicious, the other would attempt to take control of the pathogen for themselves. The Umbrella Security Service eventually attempted to arrest Dr. Birkin at the Ness facility, when a mole revealed that he was having secret talks with the US military. After being fatally shot, Dr. Birkin infected himself with the G-Virus, mutating him into a hideous Golgotha mutant. In this form, he proceeded to slaughter and massacre the Umbrella team, and the ensuing chaos led to both the G-Virus and the T-Virus spilling into Raccoon City's sewage system. After the events of the Ness facility, Dr. Birkin moved on to seek out humans to implant with G-Embryos in order to propagate his species. The number of mutants that were created because of this are unknown. It's also suspected that the virus found its way into some of the corpses in the ransacked Ness facility, creating a series of G-Zombies. And while Dr. Birkin ultimately died in a fiery inferno, his legacy carried on, with the G-Virus project being picked up by other organizations apart from Umbrella, leading to the creation of the Chrysalid virus and the infamous T-Veronica. Once the virus finds its way into a host, it begins to infect its cells, turning them into G-cells. These newly mutated cells begin to produce more of the Golgotha virus, spreading it further across the various regions of the human host's body. Because this process begins at the point of infection, the spread causes rapid asymmetrical mutations. An example of this is Dr. Birkin, who injected himself with the virus in the right arm. Because of this asymmetrical mutation process, the arm ended up becoming bigger and more muscular than the rest of his appendages, but asymmetrically buff arms are merely the tip of the hideously mutated iceberg of the effects the G-Virus has. When a G-Mutant's body is injured, it will regenerate itself just as fast as it mutates. 
Through this regeneration process, the host's DNA becomes rewritten, which leads to further mutations. In Dr. Birkin's case, this process grew him an entirely new and functional head, which eventually took over the place of Dr. Birkin's original head, causing the latter to migrate to his chest and ultimately disappear within his chest cavity. With every injury a Jew mutant sustains, the mutations on their body become more and more severe, ultimately eliminating any semblance of the original human form. Some of Dr. Birkin's more extreme transformations included the growth of two extra arms, which later mutated into legs, and the transformation of his ribcage into a mouth, with the rib serving as large, bony teeth. The crazy train of G-virus mutations doesn't stop there. There are other common elements found in G-mutants, one of which is developing fully functioning eyeballs in random regions of the body. In Dr. Birkin's case, he developed one in the right shoulder, which is where he injected himself with the virus. Birkin was also known to have been able to reproduce G embryos within several days after his infection. Later generations of G mutants, however, were observed giving birth to embryos mere minutes post-mutation. The birthing process is a stuff of nightmares, with mutants spewing the G embryos out of their mouths, likely due to their new internal physiology. The transmission of the Golgotha virus can happen in one of two ways. The first is through direct injection, just like our friend Dr. Birkin did to himself. The nest facility near Raccoon City stored several vials of the G-Virus within its creepy walls. Inside these vials, the virus was preserved by means of a protein concoction, whose mixture was purposely dyed purple in order for researchers to easily identify it. Due to the virus's short incubation period, mutation begins mere seconds after jabbing yourself with one of these purple vials of death. It's estimated that the timing may depend on the viral load carried within the vial. It's therefore possible that the virus can be slowed down by means of smaller vials carrying less of the virus. The second, and arguably more fun way to contract Golgotha, is by means of G-embryo implantation. As we discussed earlier, G-embryos are the offspring of G-mutants. Implanting them typically involves jamming them down the potential host's throat, after which the infection begins from within. If the embryo's host is closely related genetically to the G-parent, then the embryo will be absorbed, beginning the mutation process. However, if there's no genetic relation, the embryo forces its way out of the victim's body, killing them in the process. I know it all sounds quite dreadful, but if you happen to be implanted or injected with the G-Virus, there is a way to cure yourself. That is, if you're fast enough. The hardworking folk over at Nest didn't just play with the G-Virus without some form of countermeasure. While working on their deadly project, they also devised a vaccine which had a high success rate at preventing the G-Virus from infecting cells, codenamed Devil. Members of staff at Nest were recommended to take it in order to stop the G-Virus from spreading in the event of an outbreak. It's also possible to inject Devil post-infection. However, the success window is quite short due to how fast the mutation occurs, with a host that has gone too far into the mutation process ultimately rendering its effects useless. It's also important to note that successful post-infection shots still left hosts with some transformations. Because G-cells continue to produce the virus, Nest scientists had to devise a special kind of surgery to remove these cells. This is the only way to completely remove the virus from a partially mutated body. In a few rare cases, the hosts were left with some extraordinary abilities. In the case of Sherry Birkin, the daughter of Dr. Birkin, no visible extreme mutations were found in her body, despite her genetic compatibility with her father. Instead, she developed regenerative abilities after being injected with Devil by Claire Redfield. Other subjects with powers from the G-Virus, like Sherry Birkin, later came to be known as G-Humans. Resident Evil 2's G-Virus is arguably one of the deadliest and most dangerous in the series. The effects on its human hosts lead to the creation of some truly hideous creatures that have the potential to completely destroy human civilization. And the potential is still out there. Even though Dr. Birkin died after being engulfed in flames in the Nest facility, remnants of the G-Virus still remained within the RE universe, leading to the creation of even worse viruses such as the C-Virus and the T-Veronica. Because of the history of the progenitors and the more recent RE games diving into the more ancient pathogens like the Mold, it'll be fascinating to learn how they all connect with each other. Well, that's all for today, folks. Don't forget to hit the like button if you enjoyed the video, and hit subscribe as well as the notification bell to stay up to date on all my content. And if there's anything else you'd like to request, please don't hesitate to ask. As always, it's been a pleasure. Niat here with Film Comics Explained. Thanks for stopping by.